Our New Testament lesson comes from the Gospel according to Luke, the 18th chapter, verses 18 through 25. Luke 18, 18 through 25. Listen to the word of God. A certain ruler asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. He replied, I have kept all these since my youth. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, There is still one thing lacking. Sell all you have and distribute the money to the poor. Then you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he became sad, for he was very rich. Jesus looked at him and said, How hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Here in the readings. Let us pray. O God, source of all light, by your word you give light to the soul. Pour out upon us the spirit of wisdom and understanding, that being taught by you in Holy Scripture, our hearts and minds may be open to know the things that pertain to life and holiness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. I am reluctant to admit this, but they say confession is good for the soul. A number of years ago, when Jean and I took our daughter Kate to study in Hong Kong, we stayed at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. Now, as you can quickly surmise, I am not a Ritz-Carlton kind of guy. For instance, on the same trip, when we stopped to preach in Japan, we slept at the missionary guest house in Tokyo. And when we were previously in Hong Kong 10 years earlier, we stayed at the Caritas Bianchi. The Caritas Bianchi is a religious guest house where the four of us sardined ourselves into one compact room. But what our children most vividly remember is arriving for the complimentary breakfast the next morning and they put in front of Jean the morning soup. Sticking out of it was this huge bone with hair all over it. Jean passed the soup to me. Well, at the Ritz-Carlton, there were no hairy bones in any of the food. We were there because the end of summer is off season in Hong Kong and I got a great deal that even included breakfast. And after being there, I now understand why people like an upscale hotel. When we arrived at the front desk, they called me by name. Illustrating my enormous powers of perception, I asked Jean, well, how did they know it was me? Honey, she said, they, the bellman who took our luggage downstairs called up to the front desk and told them we were coming. How was I to know that? Nobody does that in a Motel 6. (laughs) And after they greet you at the front desk, they provide you with perfectly chilled peach tea and huge nut-filled chocolate chip cookies. I I think you're only supposed to get these at at check-in, but I made a habit of confiscating one every time I passed the registration desk. But here's the best part. They remembered my name every time I passed the front desk and acted like they were glad to see me. Of course, they may have remembered me because I was the only guest who came by several times a day to get cookies. But maybe even better than all this was the breakfast buffet we received with the room. Eggs Benedict, chocolate muffins, fruit, freshly squeezed orange juice. The choices were endless and the complimentary cappuccinos were as big as saucers. The only way I know to put it is that we were living large. Well, we returned home, and just over a month later, Jeannie and I traveled to perform the wedding of my college friend's son, who is my godson. 
they were having it in a resort area and doing my usual travel act of calling a multitude of places for prices. I settled on the condominium at a much cheaper rate than the resort hotels, but one my information said was very nice, and it was nice. Two bedrooms, roomy, full kitchen, pretty view, comfortable furniture. We walked in, and I turned to Jean and asked, how do you like it? And she said, it's good. Of course, it's not the Ritz-Carlton. <laughs> Expectations. All of life is filled with them. Where we stay, what car we buy, our style of clothing, our haircuts, our salaries, our children are all driven by and filled with expectations. In premarital counseling, I talk a lot about expectations, the spoken ones and the more deadly unspoken ones. I make each partner fill out a form listing where they expect to be five years from now. Items like where they will be living, how many children they will have, their jobs, financial situations, etc. And you'd be surprised how often the future bride turns to her future husband and says, what do you mean you don't expect to be living beside my parents five years from now? expectations but one area we seldom think in terms of expectations is our relationship with God one of the key elements of the Christian faith is that we are saved by grace this means that we don't earn our salvation that God loves us and forgives us in spite of our sinfulness as the scripture says our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth is not what we do that saves us but God's eternal all-encompassing love but often, we allow this doctrine of Christian grace to overshadow an equally important part of the Christian life. Those of us who have truly received this love and forgiveness will want to respond in a like manner to others and to God. None of us is perfect, but the mark of a Christian is how he or she lives. As Jesus notes, you will know Christians by their fruits. And it is this striving to be like Christ that strengthens and deepens our spiritual lives. And a huge element of this, maybe the most important element, is what we do with our money. The word believe appears 273 times in the Bible. Pray appears 371 times, and love appears 714 times. The word give appears 2,172 times. Maybe Jesus summed it up best. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now today is our annual stewardship sermon here at Westminster. Minutes for Mission and Harbinger Covers have made us aware of our priorities, that we give 28% of our budget to mission work, everything from United Ministries in Greenville to our Mission Hospital and Deaf School in Malawi. Next year's mission budget is over $764,000, and that doesn't include space, utilities, custodial care, and staff time for community groups. You also know that we put great emphasis on our children's and youth programs, that being the primary responsibility of three full-time staff members. Yet as good as all of this is, it doesn't determine our commitment to God or strengthen our personal spiritual lives. It's what we do that allows God to work within us. As we talk about this this morning and over the coming week, I want each of us to prayerfully prepare ourselves to answer this spiritual question. What percentage of my income is God calling me to give? Or as the sermon title asks, what does God expect of me. First, I believe God expects us to respond to God as God has responded to us. This biblical expectation is not there because it does something for God. Quite the contrary, the purpose of Christian stewardship is what it does for me. Giving, 
deepens and strengthens my personal spiritual life. The generous giving of my money illustrates gratitude to the God who provides all I possess. The goal of giving my money is not to meet a church budget, but to transform me spiritually and extend the life-changing love of Jesus Christ to the world. Jesus was serious when he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Giving transforms our spiritual lives. Throughout the Bible, we are warned. Money is addictive. Wealth creates power. Watch out. Money can easily become your God. Of the 38 parables Jesus told, 16 of them are about money. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, fully one-sixth of the verses deal with money. Jesus spoke more about money than sin or love. Jesus talked about money and possessions five times more than he did about prayer. Why? Because each of us makes a central choice in life. We will either become addicted to our money or to the God who gave us our money. No matter how much we may want to, we cannot do both. A church's stewardship campaign is not about how much money the church needs to pay its bills. Rather, for each of us, the question is, what is God calling me to do? There was a wealthy man who was near death, and he was very grieved because he'd worked so hard for his money, and he wanted to take it with him to heaven. So he began to pray that he might be allowed to take some of his wealth with him. Well, an angel heard his plea and appeared to him, and the angel said, I'm sorry, but you can't take your wealth with you. Well, the man begged the angel to speak to God and see if God might just make a, 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 an exception this one time. And the man continued to pray that his wealth would follow him. Well, lo and behold, the angel reappeared and informed the man that God had decided to allow him to take one suitcase with him. Overjoyed, the man gathered his largest suitcase and filled it with pure gold bars and placed it beside his bed. Well, soon afterward, he died and showed up at the gates of heaven to greet St. Peter. St. Peter, seeing the suitcase, said, hold on, you can't bring that in here with you. Well, the man explained to St. Peter that he had permission to ask him to verify his story with God. And sure enough, St. Peter checked it out. He came back and he said, you're right, you're allowed one carry-on bag. But I'm supposed to check the contents before letting it through. So St. Peter opens the suitcase to inspect the worldly items that the man found too precious to leave behind. And seeing all of the gold bars, St. Peter exclaimed, You brought bricks for street pavement? Is wealth that important to us? Our most precious possession? Or like God, do we see money as just another ingredient to help us build the highway leading to the kingdom of Jesus Christ? Second, when we ask ourselves what God is calling us to do, we must first look to the Bible for guidance. Throughout the Old Testament, God tells his people they are to return a tithe, 10% of their income back to him. This was also an ancient practice among the Phoenicians, Arabians, Carthaginians, Chinese, Greeks, and Romans. Aristotle referred to the tithe as an ancient law. Therefore, in ancient times, people brought 10% of their crops, their farm animals, their products to be used for God's work. The New Testament carries the same expectation, although Jesus upped the ante by noting that one should not limit himself to 10%, but give generously. Why would a Christian give 10% of his or her income to God? To show our gratitude for God's love and forgiveness to demonstrate our commitment to God's work in the world, to in a tangible way illustrate our partnership with God in living and serving, to provide a check on our greed 
and materialism and to lead us into a deeper, stronger spiritual life. Stewardship is not about the church trying to get money out of us. It is the fuel, the food for our own spiritual lives. When we feel we just can't get close to God, it may be because our real God is money. Generous giving says God's work is important. Minimal giving declares that we believe what God does in the world is of marginal significance. Now, some of you may feel that you just cannot give 10% of your income. You can start at 2 or 3% and each year add a percent or two. What is important is that spiritually we give to place God at the center of our lives. And for most of us, money is the most significant decision to allow that to happen. And only percentage giving can provide us an adequate guide to do this. Giving makes us a partner with God in accomplishing God's work both within us and around us. This week, as each of us receives our commitment card in the mail, let us ask ourselves this central question. What is God calling me to give as a percentage of my income? Retired Pastor Curtis Jones told of a splendid church member and friend who related this story. Years ago, four good friends and neighbors from a small southern town were driving to a football game in an adjoining state. After 100 miles or so of sports chatter, the conversation turned to family budgets. The four compared costs of the necessities of life, insurance, automobile, other items. They all had young children and modest income, so they found that they had much in common stretching their do dollars to provide for their families. One of the foursome quietly stated that the first item in his family budget was a tithe, 10% of his family income. A second and then a third indicated that they also gave the first tenth of each dollar to God's work. The fourth man in the group sat in silent shock. He had thought of himself as a pretty good churchman since he was president of his Sunday school class and fairly regular in worship attendance. He had heard sermons on tithing all his life, but it did not occur to him that regular fellows like these friends and neighbors, football fans even, were tithing. He would have wondered how they could afford it when he was straining to give 1%. Now he was hearing their matter-of-fact statements that their family financing was working better because of these gifts, not in spite of them. At that moment in his life, he felt the presence of God in his three companions, and he resolved to become a tither. I was that fourth man, he told Jones, and on that football Saturday, I learned how the power of God is revealed through Christian witness. Tithing. Giving 10% of our income deepens our spiritual life. It opens an avenue, a way for God to work within our hearts and draw us closer to God. Giving focuses our priorities on God, enables us to put God at the center of our lives. This morning, what is God calling you to do? What does God expect of me? It's really not about expectation. It's about love. Love of God versus love of things, money, or anything else instead of God. Jesus talked about it more than anything else because he knew the power money has in our lives. Percentage giving is the Bible's way of wrestling control of our lives from the temptation of money, setting us on a course to deepen our relationship with God. This week, you will receive a pledge card in the mail. We're requesting that you fill it out and bring it to church with you next Sunday. At both services, during the last hymn, we are asking you to bring that pledge card up front 
and place it on the communion table. This will be an individual or family dedication as we focus not on programs or budget, but on our com personal commitment to God and his son, Jesus Christ. Our financial commitments are a step in drawing us closer to the God who loves us, forgives us, and seeks to be the most important element of our lives. During the next week, let each of us prayerfully ask ourselves this question. As I seek to deepen my relationship to God and to do my part in accomplishing God's work and will, What is God calling me to give as a percentage of my income?